you have a Bible this morning and you'll read with us, I'd like to ask you to turn to Psalm 19. Psalm chapter 19. And I'm going to read all 14 verses of Psalm 19. The first portion of this is likely very familiar to you, and for good reason today. Um, Psalm 19, this is a Psalm of David, and beginning in verse 1, it reads, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. That will conclude our reading this morning, Psalm 19, verses 1 through 14. And I'd like to take a title this morning from the final verse, though we're going to look at the entirety of the psalm if, if The Lord will help us to do that. Um, The title of the message this morning is The Meditations of the Heart. The Meditations of the Heart. Before we jump into these 14 verses, I'd like to uh, set, I guess, somewhat of a a framework for these verses. I want you to try to rewind back to Monday morning if you can. Uh, Some of you can't hardly remember this morning, so I don't know how Monday morning is going to be, but uh, I want you to rewind to the beginning of this week, and from that point until today, you have had thousands of thoughts, thousands and thousands of thoughts in just the last week. I don't know if someone tried to count how many thoughts that they have in a day or even in an hour that we could do it accurately. Because our minds run so quickly. And to us, it can feel like one fluid conversation that makes sense to us. Uh, But if we were to listen to your thoughts, we would think, where'd that come from? And where did that go? And why did that go there? But to you, there is a reason. We're all different. We think differently. And as I consider a week's worth of thoughts, a day's worth of thoughts, um, a 
lot of places that my thoughts go, I wish they wouldn't. Um, Many of us, duties captivate our thoughts. And there's nothing sinful about that. If you work, if you're a homemaker, if you're a student, um, if you have other roles that you play, then certainly... Much of your thoughts during the week are directed towards executing those responsibilities. And there's nothing wrong with that. Even if you're really busy, we can think that our thoughts have to be directed to all those various responsibilities. But amidst those responsibilities, we have a lot of thought freedom. Um, I was mowing the yard this week, and the only thing you have to do is stay on the line. And so, for a little over an hour, I'm kind of alone with my thoughts. And there's nothing binding me to thinking anything in specifically. They're just allowed to freely roam. And the Bible reveals to us an ugly truth. That our nature... The nature of our thoughts, along with every other part of our nature, gravitates towards sin. So our minds and musings, they take us to a variety of places. Um, Idle thoughts, things that don't amount to anything. Just silly thoughts. Sinful thoughts. But there are occasions when, by God's grace, it's as though he sets a boundary upon our thoughts. Or he directs the course of our thoughts. There have been days where I woke up and I pledged, I guess you would say, to the Lord... I'm going to think on these things. I'm going to do these good things. I'm going to keep my heart from these things. And by the end of the hour, not only have I broken that pledge, but I'm plunged in the very things that I forbid myself from going to. I, the Roman writer talks about that. If you make your own law, you're, you're going to break it. Right. But there are times when God elevates us. I'm convinced that very often God works mostly when we're unaware that He is working. He is doing things in us. He is directing our thoughts, our desires, and we don't even recognize that it's Him. We think that it's our mind taking free course. When in reality, God is gently nudging and guiding certain things. As I have read this 19th Psalm, I can't tell you how many times this week, and dwelt upon this Psalm, I don't know where David was in his life. Was he a shepherd sitting upon the hillside watching the sheep graze? Ignorant of what life beheld? I don't know. It says to the chief musician, so was he the king sitting in a palace in Jerusalem responsible for protecting a nation? I don't know. But it seems to me as I read this 19th Psalm that the heart and mind of David in these moments, God has directed God has caused him to rise to a rock that is higher than we are. And rather than attempting vainly of our own strength to dwell upon spiritual things and to do spiritual duties, God of his own will and accord has helped David to rise above this sinful flesh. And David, for these very few moments, is focused on and meditating upon the things that matter. And as I was reading this, what really jumped out to me is the perception that David has about the life 
and about the world and how at times I can identify with what David is seeing, whereas most of the time my mind is in the drudgery of the worldly things and I don't see this. I have seen it, but I don't see it. And so this morning, I want to try and call you to the place that David is at. On the the mountain of spiritual grace where God has restrained the darkness of the world, has restrained the duties of the world, has restrained all of the things that interrupt our spiritual intercession and our enlightened eyes from seeing the world that God is in, I want to call you to a place of reality that is when God helps us to see it. So what David is describing, I want you to get this, exists all the time. But we only see it a small part of the time. This Psalm is broke up into three very distinct parts. You can see it very easily. And I imagine David, this psalm beginning early in the morning. He's in the palace, and he awakens, and he walks outside. And as you well know, when you wake up in the morning, if you're an early riser and you step outside before the sun comes up, What a beautiful sight you are about to behold when you watch the sun rise. And David steps out upon that balcony in the darkness and in the solitude of the darkness. And then suddenly the first bird begins to chirp. I love that. I don't like it when I'm in bed, but I like it when I'm already up. For that first bird to begin to sing and then the second one and then just I don't even know how how to accurately describe it the darkness is interrupted and at first you can just barely catch a glimpse of the world that you were not previously able to see And this takes place in the matter of just moments. And then all of a sudden, it's like instantly God paints a beautiful canvas. Now what's interesting about the language that David uses that we don't fully get in the English is that he uses what I would call effusive language. Or he is proclaiming and declaring what the world does. So he begins, and in the original, if I understand it right, and I I, I tried to dive into this extensively, he uses words to describe what is going on in the world. He uses words like to tell all, to declare the glory of God, to pour forth. He says, the heavens are telling, this is another version, the heavens are telling of the glory of God and the expanse, the sky is declaring the work of his hands. Day unto day, so every single day, pours forth speech. Night unto night reveals knowledge. So it tells us that God is not just subtly revealing his glory to the world. But if you wake up tomorrow morning before the sun arises, God is going to pour forth his knowledge to you. At the chirping of the bird and at the beauty of the sunrise, in the complexity of the world around us, if you'll pause for a moment and look at nature in all of its glory, it is primarily God's attempt to pour forth his greatness for you to see. They say, I don't know if this is true, I'm not an astronomer, 
But they say that Earth is situated in a very unique place where most planets do not have the view that we have of the universe. But that we're situated, and I've heard atheist scientists say, it's as though we're situated to be able to observe the universe. And I think, we are. We're placed even in orbit the way that we are so that God can effusively pour forth his glory and greatness for your very eyes to see. And as morning after morning passes by and you and I awake and our first minds run to responsibility and our first mind, our, the first thoughts of our minds run to the needs that we might have and the needs that we're trying to meet for ourselves and for others and for our workplace, it's as though David awakes amidst day after day of monotony and responsibility where he does not see God's glory, where he is blinded by all of these things that he is concerned with where the thoughts and meditations of his heart are constantly on the, the underworld, this place down here. But it's as though one morning God through his grace awakens David and as David ste steps out upon that portico and he looks at the rising of the sun, it's like God has enlightened his eyes to see the glory which has always been but which his eyes were darkened to. And he is pouring forth this effusive praise to God. He sees. He sees the greatness of God in what is all around. And then he begins to remark that he is not advantaged in this area. Right? In a culture which speaks of advantage and disadvantage and preference, I want you to know that whether David was a shepherd boy sitting upon a hill or whether he was a king sitting and looking outside of his, uh, of his palace, all of us have a front row seat to the glory of God's nature. When I was in college, I used to go to this park. It was right down the road from my house, and here's the thought that would overcome me. I'd, I'd go back into this park, and I go back to this little stream where there was a bridge. Not many people knew that it was there, even in the little community we were in. And I would go under this bridge. It's going to sound strange, but I would watch the critters. I'd just watch. I'd just look at nature. And I can remember thinking I would look down near the stream, and I would see just little ants, little bugs. And they were just crawling forth. And it would cross my mind often. Most likely, I'll be the only person to lay my eyes on those ants. It's so obscure that most people in this little city don't even know this place is here. And those that do, that come to this park... They walk all the paths and they play on the basketball courts and they play on the swing sets. But most people don't come right here and observe these little things. And I would think how that little ant was made for the glory of God. Whether anybody saw it or not, it was created to give God glory. And the psalmist moves from remarking about God's glory to making sure we realize that it is something that is universally seen and understood by all men. There is not a speech or a language where the voice of nature is not heard, pouring forth the message of God's glory. One of the reasons why I love to travel is to see the variety of God's design of his glory. I love seeing the desert. Not because I'd want to live there. Because it's a manifestation of the unique creative glory of God. Talking to Brother Binion this week, Tim Binion, he's going to the Grand, Can uh, the Grand Canyon. It's just something on my bucket list I always wanted to do. 
It's a good thing to have on your bucket list because it's screaming forth the glory of God. Niagara Falls, never been there. Love to go. Why? I love to hear about the volumes of water, no, but I want to see the glory of God. And here, the psalmist tells us, yes, you can go tour the world and see those things, but also remember, I bring it to you every morning. Do you see it? Like, do you strive to see? Because remember, his mind is elevated right now. So first, he begins, and I'm not going to get it through all six verses, but he begins to, he, he just reveals to us how universal and how exceptional that God's glory in creation is. But the psalmist does not stay contented there. It's like, have you ever gotten almost like in a, a cascading series of praise where God reveals how good he is to you? And then it's like he continues to reveal it. And so while you're praising him, your mind is fluidly flipping from one praise to the next praise to the next praise to the next praise. And God just keeps revealing and revealing and revealing and revealing. And you keep seeing things which, yes, you have always known, but the light in which God enlightens your mind and your eyes, it's just overwhelming when you recognize in those moments God's glory and blessing is Full in my life. Everything about my life is interwoven with God's handiwork and presence. And the psalmist is just overwhelmed in praise. And he starts with the least of praise, which is for the nature that God has put around him. And he moves to the next one. And he begins to talk about the law of the Lord. I've always found this fascinating about the Psalms and really about the whole Old Testament, but it's most common in the Psalms that over and over the different psalmists praise God for his word. And, and sometimes they're, it feels redundant. Sometimes it, 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 they just get so descriptive, they just keep talking about his word and talking about his word and talking about his word. And when I pause for a moment and I consider they only had a small part of the revelation of God's word. Yet that little fragment that they had, the psalmist values so much. And so he gets into this series of acknowledgments of God's word. He describes it differently, five or six different ways he describes it. But notice in verse 7, he says this, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Now, one of the things that I fear in myself and in Christian people is that certain truths become so accepted, they, use, they lose their profoundness. Or in other words, think of it like this. If you are dependent upon somebody... And they're always reliable and always there. And they never fail you. Most likely you begin to take them for granted. Most likely you just accept they're always going to be. And the virtues and qualities which make them so dependable are always going to be there for you to depend on. And I think sometimes when we consider God's word and its accessibility and its regularity in which we consider it, we lose the fact in our hearts and our minds of the profoundness of what this is. Listen, in all of the world, whether a man speaks it, whether a man writes it, whatever, whether a man thinks it, nothing that is derived from man is perfect. But there is one thing that is always perfect. The incredible comfort that that can bring us, that I can go to one place in the world, one place, and I can open it up, and I can know with certainty 
This is perfect. It has no flaws. And as much as man tries to tie it in a knot, as much as man attempts to uh, bring two or three different things together and say, look how contradictory they are. For those that truly try to understand it and have God's eyes enlighten them, what what becomes more and more uh, 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 obvious to me the more I read it is how supernatural that the truths contained in in this word really are. It's amazing how God's word really does identify the thoughts of my heart. There are times when God reveals something in his word and I just laugh because of how perfect and accurate that it is. It's almost, it's like somebody was reading my mind thousands of years ago. Because they were. He says, it's perfect. And then he seems to go on the succession of what the word of God does. So it's perfect, so it converts the soul. Without the truth, the knowledge of the truth, you're never going to find Jesus Christ. But I'm thankful that the words um, multidimensional. Its use is not just to bring life to people. Its, its, its use is not just able to bring you wise to the knowledge of salvation. But look at the next thing he says about it. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. So at first you're converted by it, you're saved by it. But you're still ignorant. You know, it's like you've been just because you've been given a textbook doesn't mean you understand it. You have possession of it. And the possession of it's a wonderful thing. But what you have to do is open it up and begin to dig and dive and saturate yourself in it to begin to understand it. And what the Bible teaches us about his word is that not only can its contents show us the way to life, but furthermore, once we have life, it can show us the way to abundant life. It can show, it can make those who are simple and ignorant wise. It can disciple us. I said last week, one of the most dangerous things people in the world is a person who has been saved that does not know the word of God. It's dangerous to be there. These words can make you wise. And as you see the the brokenness of our culture and world, and when you look even at your own life and you see the brokenness of your own life, most of the time the brokenness of your own life is due to a willful ignorance or application of God's Word because it's there to make you and I wise where we can understand how to live. I'm so thankful that this is not some abstract philosophy book whereby we come every week and we just throw around random principles that are metaphysical that have no concrete meaning in reality. Rather, when we take the Word of God and we implement these truths in the most sensitive part of our being, they work. They work. you depend on them and they if you don't you don't work your life and if you look at the broken areas we all have broken areas of our life we all have sinful parts of our being and if you look closely at those places and ask God to reveal it to you what you'll most likely find is that that is a place whereby the world of God has no dominion in your life that's why, there's, that's why there's chaos. There was chaos in the beginning of creation. And then the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the deep. And suddenly, there was no longer chaos. It's the same in our life. When you feel out of control, ask yourself that question, does God rule here? Not as he invited here. Not does he once in a while make an appearance here. Does he have dominion here? He continues. He says, tells us this. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. So, I see a succession here. The Word of God, you get this knowledge God reveals to you. And of course, through His Holy Spirit, makes it real. And through the application of the Spirit, He saves your soul. Then, 
you begin to read his word and you're being discipled, you're being instructed, you're growing as a student to understand how to be godly, how to glorify him. And then you get past just understanding because the purpose of being discipled is not just, I want to be able to to do well on Bible trivia. I want to be able to defend the faith. That's not the purpose of it. All of those things may come into play, but he says, I continue to throw myself at the statues of the Lord because they bring joy. If you're a Christian and your life is void of spiritual joy, I would question how deeply immersed you are in the word of the Lord. Because there are times when I... And I I'm not even going to try to explain it. All I'll say is this. When I have the word of God open and God and me begin to commune over his word, sometimes I just feel this immense joy that overflows. And I don't even know what it is, you know? Because it's a combination of so many things all at one moment that I'm reading his word and I'm not just saying, okay, this will help me out of this problem. Okay, if I do this, that'll make my work where my life works here. Okay, if I remember this, then I'll be able to tell this person who doesn't believe in the Bible these things. It's not that. There are many times as I was reading Psalm 19 and I was reading it and I was reading it and I was reading it. Uh, Multiple times my heart was just filled with joy. Just that this is written here and that I can commune with God, that I can look around and he can say, the heavens declare the glory of God. And then I look at the heavens and they're declaring the glory of God. And I can rejoice in him through his word. When a person does not study the word, it's not about beating you as some taskmaster and saying, well, this is the Christian duty and you're not doing it. So you're failing. No, you're forfeiting a great joy that you can have. And you've all experienced, if you've been saved for any period of time, where, again, God took you to the cleft of the rock, where God took you out to the portico, where God took you to the the hill, just as David is, and for whatever reason you were immersed in God's grace, and for whatever reason you broke the habits of your mind, you broke the habits of your life, and you began to really read his word, and God began to speak to you, and your heart was so full, and you came into the house of God, and you were just praising God, and you were saying, I'm so glad that this is where my heart is, and I'm so glad God has fellowship with me this week. There's joy in the word, but he's not done. The command of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. It's it's an amazing thing how differently you see the world when God saves you if you continue to yield obedience to him. I mean, you can go back and be tainted with the vision that you once had, largely. But it's just amazing how how differently you see the world when your mind is constantly in his word. They're like glasses that you put on and you don't take off. And suddenly, you start seeing the motives of the world and of Satan. You start seeing a warfare that once you were not seeing, even in your own self. Those things that you thought were regular and habitual and normal and okay, suddenly you become suspicious of them and you start saying, you know what? I didn't realize how much that was stealing the meditations of my heart and mind. Suddenly that thing that was of leisure, suddenly that thing that I enjoyed, I now see as attacking my spiritual well-being. You can see. Suddenly God gives you clarity into the problem sometimes in other people's lives. And not just like, okay, I analyze them well. I'm not talking about that. I'm saying God divinely shows you a stumbling block in somebody else's life. A temptation that someone else might be subject to. God enlightens the eyes. You all remember the story in the book of Kings when Elisha's servant had his eyes opened? (laughs) The difference in what he saw a moment before and a moment after. He's blinded by his own lack of faith. He's terrified of the Syrian army surrounding them. The prayer goes, Lord, enlighten his eyes. Open his eyes. And he sees 
and there's a host of supernatural angelic beings surrounding that city ready to fight on their behalf. And suddenly, no doubt, his fear went from personal fear of his own well-being to the fear that the Syrian army ought to have for their well-being. What a change. What a transformation that he was no longer afraid for himself whatsoever because he could see. Guess what the word of God does? It helps us to see things that we need to see. I want to get to the place I really want to get to this morning. He tells us, I'm not going to get to these last two because I don't have time, but in verse 10 and 11, he says this. Speaking of the word of God, it's more to be desired than any gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. So he comes to the conclusion of this, praising God for his nature, praising, or for nature itself, praising God for the law of God. And then it's as if the psalmist knows himself. He knows what his propensity is. He knows that this is a rock that he is just temporarily on. A spiritual plane that most of the time he forfeits. And he's afraid of that. He can see the, the darkness that he chooses to live in most of the time. And so he makes this prayer about the future. In the present. And there's two things he prays for that are so, so fascinating to me. He says, Lord, who can know their secret sins? It's good, I don't want to say paranoid, it, it's good to be humbled by the awareness that you might have sin you don't even see. You do have sin you don't see. There's not a maybe. You do. I do. I have sin that I don't see. And not only that other people do see, but there are sins that other people don't see in me. And so he, he prays this prayer of humility and he says, Lord, who can know their secret sins? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. It's amazing how, at times, the founda- parts of the foundation of our life can be securely built upon sins which we ourselves are oblivious to. And thus... We consciously and subconsciously avoid any discussion or revelation about those things because simply we don't want them to be revealed. Why? Because things are built on them. Things we like, things we enjoy are built upon those very things. But the psalmist wants to be cleansed of them. He doesn't say, let me see them. He says, it's like he jumps to the point. Because we can see something and then not do anything about it. But the psalmist doesn't play with sin. He doesn't try to have God put up options for him and say, yeah, yeah, it's a sin I commit sometimes. And yeah, I'll think about at times periodically removing them and not. He gets right to the main part of it. He says, Lord, cleanse me of it. Because listen, the benefit of being cleansed by my secret sins far outweighs whatever cost it will have to me. I want it gone. But then he goes on to the next one and he talks about presumptuous sins. I think you all know what the word presumption means. When you assume upon something right, or presume upon something. Now this is David speaking here. Now presumptuous sins actually has a very specific meaning in the Bible especially in Jewish Old Testament. Go back to Numbers 15. I'd encourage you all to go back to Numbers 15 because what Numbers 15 happens is that God identifies sins of ignorance and sins of presumption. And the real famous case that comes out of Numbers 15 is that there's a man walking on the Sabbath and he's picking up sticks. 
And the people find him picking up sticks. And they bring him to Moses and they say, what do we do with them? And Moses says, I want you to stone him, put him to death. And everyone says, whoa, God is a God of justice and vengeance. And man, that is awful harsh. And even in modern day, atheists will say, you know what? That's an example that God is immoral. A man is picking up sticks so you kill him? Oh, no, 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 no. Just like in the Garden of Eden, there's much more going on with Adam and Eve than them just plucking a fruit and taking a bite. And in this case, there's much more going on because God's word had gone forth in numbers that said, do not work on the Sabbath. Don't do it. And everyone had the knowledge of that. And God comes and he says, if you commit a sin of ignorance, there remaineth a sacrifice for you. You can be atoned for a sin of ignorance. But in all the Old Testament, there is one sin that is not atoned for, and that is the sin of presumption. That is this. I know what God's will is about this. I know I ought not to do this. God has convicted me about it. But I don't care. I'm going to do it anyway. The New Testament, I think, in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 through 29, is talking about presumptuous sin. And he says, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins for us if we're going to sin presumptuously. Here's here's my point in bringing this up. David, David, the great man of God, David, says, Lord, cleanse me from my secret sins, but I also know I have the capacity to to commit the worst of sin, which is sins completely with my eyes open and I do it in rebellion. So he prays this, keep me from that. As though he is saying, I can't keep myself from it. You must keep me even from the most horrible of presumptuous sins. Do you see in this moment how humbled that David is through this whole psalm? He's marveling that God brings him the grace of nature. He marvels that God is gracious enough to show him pure, undefiled truth. And then in the very end, he's humbled enough to look at himself and say, Lord, I know I create, I know I commit secret sins. I know I create, I make, I do sin on purpose without any regard for who you are. Lord, please help me from all sin. And he concludes with this benediction. One that people sing one that people know through memory in verse 14. He says this, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. You know, I think he's praying here. Keep my heart right where it is right now. I don't want to think in the freedom of my thoughts about anything else but you and your glory. The Bible tells us that James warns us. He says, careful with your mouth because out of it proceeds cursings and blessings. And you know, the fickleness of human beings, the fallenness of human beings, we can say cursings and blessings about the same person. Isn't that fascinating? One day, you can be really pleased with a person and you can bless them. And the next day, they can make you mad And not only is the same mouth blessing and cursing, the same mouth is blessing and cursing the same person. But then Jesus told us, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so the origin of it is the heart. And so here the psalmist prays this final thing, and then we're done. He says, Lord, let the words of my mouth, but even more so, the things that I think in my heart be approved by you, be accepted by you. Here's one thing I greatly fear about Christian people. That they take false consolation in the godly works they do, never considering that God weighs the heart. So you might be busied about doing all these good deeds and people might profusely praise you for all the good works that you commit. And yet, what David is praying here is, Lord, 
let the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Because if the root is clean, so will the branches be. This morning, think about what you think about. Be aware of what you think about. And ask God to help your thoughts be drawn to His glory and not the things of this world. That's our message this morning. I pray that it would help you. The psalm was a blessing to me to read this week, and I pray that God would help me to see the world the way David does here.